London Stock Exchange Group congratulates the women in banking and finance on their 40th anniversary. Gender equality is crucial for the future success of our industry. And we've come a long way in the last 40 years, but we all know we have a lot more to do. And this is why the London Stock Exchange Group is proud to support the Accelerating Change Together research program so that as an industry, we can continue to help women to thrive and we can make the workplace much better for everyone. Women in Banking and Finance are celebrating their 40th anniversary this year. To commemorate this exciting occasion, we're also launching our Accelerating Change Together research program in collaboration with the London School of Economics and the Wisdom Council. A huge thank you to our sponsors and to all of our members at Women in Banking and Finance, without whom and their support, this wouldn't have been possible. Today, we look forward to hearing the inaugural survey findings, which will form part of that important report. Thank you for your support. Good morning. My name is Vivian Arts, President of Women in Banking and Finance, and I'm delighted that you're able to join us at the virtual market opening of the London Stock Exchange today. A huge thank you to the London Stock Exchange for hosting us. We are looking forward to an exciting event with the unveiling of WIBF's inaugural survey findings on our accelerating Change Together research program presented by WIBF's Head of Research. This will be followed by a panel discussion with our very distinguished speakers who will further explore and discuss some of the insights and learnings from the survey and what they mean for firms in practice. But let me start by sharing with you the journey that has brought us to this exciting moment. Why did we embark on a research project and the specific topic of the missing middle? The answer goes to the heart of WIBF as a one-of-a-kind volunteer-led, nationwide, not-for-profit membership network, which has been championing women in the financial services sector for 40 years. It came from the engagement with our members in seeking to understand what are the pressing gender and inclusion challenges 
that they are facing in their ambition to ensure that we unlock the full potential of financial services for all. And the message from our members was clear and consistent. The challenge is the missing middle, the critical talent pipeline, which sits between the entry level to our sector and the most senior levels. The success of achieving equality of opportunity and representation at both the junior and senior levels depends on the talent pipeline in the middle. And this is where we are seeing women's careers stalling or women leaving. Having identified the challenge, WIBF engaged with experts in the field to put together the Accelerating Change Together research program. With the support from our sponsors and expertise from the London School of Economics and the Wisdom Council. This is indeed an action-oriented, groundbreaking and unique endeavour, which will offer unique insights derived from the excellent work conducted during the extraordinary circumstances in which we find ourselves as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. And practical recommendations will result as to what we can do to address them. Aside from the approach which reached out across the breadth and depth of the financial services sector, the results are distinguished by their unique timing, which is particularly helpful as we grapple with the future of the workplace and what this will look and feel like as a result of the COVID-19 experience, which has impacted us all and in different ways. So it is with great pleasure and pride and to mark WIBF's 40th anniversary that I welcome you today to the launch of this primary research, which gathers quantitative and qualitative insights, culminating in a report of actionable recommendations and interventions for our sector. Before I finish, I'd like to address a few housekeeping matters. The first is that we're using Slido today, which will enable you to submit questions to our mm -hmm. panelists. To access Slido, go to WIBF LSEG, that's the code, and it's slido.com. In addition, the event is being recorded and a link will be shared shortly after the event. And now, I am delighted to hand over to David Schwimmer, who needs no introduction as the CEO of the London Stock Exchange to say a few words. Thank you, Vivian. Good morning, everyone, and happy Thanksgiving uh, to those of you for whom that is a relevant holiday. First of all, let me echo Diane's words and offer my warmest congratulations to women in banking and finance on the 40th anniversary. We are honored to be able to celebrate this landmark date with you and to support the launch of the Accelerating Change Together report. Here at London Stock Exchange Group, we're committed to promoting gender equality and broader diversity inclusion at all levels. And through the work of our Women Inspired Network, WIN, and other diversity networks such as Being and Proud, we aim to drive positive cultural change and ensure that our employees have equal access to opportunities. Now, I know we'll hear about the report in detail shortly, but I wanted to briefly touch on the importance of equal access. I was not surprised to see from the initial research findings that women in the finance industry do not lack career ambition, nor do they lack the confidence to ask for promotions or pay raises. However, they sometimes lack access to career development opportunities advocacy, and career advice. It is fascinating to witness the end of the stigma around flexible working, and that can clearly benefit women. I think these findings are really important as we try to promote equal opportunity and build a level playing field for both women and men from all backgrounds. And I look forward to hearing more about the report and participating in today's panel discussion. Congratulations again, and thank you. Thank you, David, for your warm welcome. It now gives me great pleasure to introduce Elise Badwa, WIBF Head of Research and Deputy Head of Research at City, who will give us an overview and some insights into the survey findings. Over to you, Elise. Thank you, Vivienne, and thank you uh, to the London Stock Exchange for hosting us today. Uh, I'm extremely excited uh, to share uh, the highlights of our inaugural ACT uh, research survey program. 
Uh, obviously, uh, what I'm going to do now is uh, during the next 10 minutes, I'll go over some of the key findings uh, which will inform our panel. Uh, and I'd like to think that we'll go into the more nuanced uh, ways uh, uh, and the new, more nuanced findings into the panel. I'm going to go through the actual uh, hard uh, uh, evidence and the data as well as its interpretation. Uh, but before I do that, I'd like to take a step back and uh, uh, essentially look, look at uh, the program and put it in context for you. So when Vivian, our president, approached me uh, in September 2019 uh, to lead and coordinate the project, uh, I felt the opportunity was absolutely unique. And this is really because, uh, as you can see from this slide, uh, the project is sponsored across the financial industry. Uh, and it's also conducted by uh, academics. And it's not, it's an, it's not uh, the potentially biased findings of one isolated organization or in corporate. Uh, in terms of sponsors, you, you can see uh, them there. We're very lucky uh, to be supported by uh, Egon Blackrock, Goldman Sachs, Moody, Santander, Bailey Gifford, City, HSBC, Morgan Stanley, Schroeder's Personal Wealth, Barclays, EY, the London Stock Exchange Group, Refinitiv, and the Cumberland. Um, we're very, very, we're delighted that the Financial Conduct Authority, as well as AFME, are also supporters, and our media partner is CTAM. Now, obviously, if you have uh, at this very minute you're watching this and your uh, your, your your bank or, or the insurer you work for or the asset manager you work for is not on there, uh, please feel free to contact our head of uh, thought leadership, Liz Hughes. She'll be delighted to send you uh, 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 the way to become a sponsor. We have very very few spaces left, uh, uh, and and so she'll be delighted to help with that. Uh, now, moving on. Uh, with this survey, what were we hoping to to uh, to achieve, really? Um, I think the genesis of the research uh, was to really, uh, for the 40th anniversary of women in banking and finance, uh, try to equip, uh, try to become a resource uh, for our sponsors, try to influence policy and be a resource providing practical and behavioral advice uh, for, for the uh, WIBF uh, corporate sponsors. Um, the first thing we had to do with Lee Hsu when I uh, joined uh, the project is we had to do uh, to, to conduct a selective search for an, an academic partner. And I'm pleased to say uh, that we're now in partnership with Dr. Grace Lorden of the London School of Economics and her team of cutting edge behavioral scientists. Uh, in addition, uh, we also uh, recruited the Wisdom Council, a financial services consumer insight an engagement specialist uh, to conduct the first quantitative survey and interpret its results. So looking uh, on the next slide, I'm going to go through our program. Uh, the, the research program is four years. We're essentially in the first year of those four years. Uh, the theme and, and the, uh, that we're looking to explore is the missing middle. Uh, we're looking to uh, understand why women are leaving, uh, uh, why there's a lower percentage of women in senior roles and entry level, and why uh, this pipeline is essentially leaking. Uh, so we have uh, conducted stage one, which was a review of the existing landscape. Uh, stage two was to conduct the online survey. We're going to go through the results now. Uh, this will inform stage three, which uh, essentially uh, is a series of qualitative interviews that Dr. Grace Lorden of the LSE will conduct. And then finally at stage four, uh, we're hoping uh, that we'll come up with some uh, very insightful uh, inter possible intervention and practical recommendations for, for the corporates to implement and measure. So now on to uh, onto the survey. Uh, the survey uh, had in excess of 2,000 respondents uh, in terms of uh, it's a wide range of financial sectors that were polled. We also have good representations on on, on type of roles and seniority. Uh, of Lucy, I should flag that uh, both men and women were polled. And then finally, uh, I should flag why also this was a unique uh, moment, uh, obviously, to, uh, to survey. Uh, it, the, the, essentially, the survey was pulled during the pandemic uh, and therefore uh, provide insight during what is, in my view, the largest uh, work experiment uh, ever attempted. What are the key findings? Uh, so I'm going to summarize broadly the key findings. Obviously, please refer to the uh, 20 page plus document that we've put out uh, last Monday, and you can find all the graph, all the numbers uh, backing uh, the conclusions that I'm going to go through now. Uh, the first um, the first big conclusion is essentially, uh, I'll summarize it as there's no aspiration gap. Uh, so 
women do not lack aspiration nor the confidence to uh, lean in and ask uh, and work is essentially a major source of satisfaction uh, to them irrespective of their family situation but there are differences in outcome in genders uh, and women are more likely to perceive their career progress to be behind their peers and we can talk here about uh, perception obviously uh, on the panel we can debate it because we we don't know whether there's you know we couldn't call uh, uh, we couldn't find out whether it was true that perception but actually this is definitely something that came out in the in the survey secondly access to development opportunities is key uh, the majority of women um, uh, seem to be uh, failing to achieve a positive career cycle uh, of essentially access to stress uh, assignment uh, leading on to a sense of progress uh, leading on to optimism about achieving their aspirations um, and and that is something that that we that definitely we need to look into as we go into the quality of interviews the third set uh, of results uh, is essentially around the COVID crisis and the giant work experiment that I've um, that I've mentioned. That has uh, that, that there is definitely a positive impact with evidence of a shift in attitudes uh, towards flexible working. Uh, it shows the impact essentially of experienced behaviors uh, leading to changes in attitudes. So we'll we'll talk about that a bit more. And then finally. A very important point, and I know Grace. This I know this is something Grace will certainly talk about, is this concept of perception of fairness in the working environment, which is critical to satisfaction and low intention to leave. Uh, there are gender differences, and that's probably the place where we found the most gender differences around the perception and definition of equality, which must be addressed uh, to essentially a law organisation uh, and the industry uh, to move forward. So I'll go through very quickly uh, some of the charts. Uh, I've mentioned that there's a, there's no gender gap, there's no aspiration gap. Gender is not a driver of aspiration or the importance of work. Uh, on the far right, you can see uh, the bar chart. Uh, work plays an important part in women's lives, and it's a major source of satisfaction. Uh, in fact, uh, by by a few points it is a, a larger source of satisfaction to women than it seems to be to the male respondent uh, secondly women returning to work with children show the same aspiration and in fact the largest uh, uh, ambition um, so you have 72 uh, percent uh, 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 of women with young children who says that they aspire to become a senior leader and that's against say an average of uh, 58 uh, percent for, for men but then outcomes seems to not match aspiration, or at least that is the perception and that is what women have said in this survey. Uh, women are more likely to experience less positive outcomes. They are less optimistic that they will achieve their aspiration, although it does vary by sector and we can go in, into the detail. So in, in, uh, in summary, women are hungry for opportunities, uh, but they're less likely to get stretch assignments. Uh, and it seems to be that this uh, 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 pack of women, the missing middle, that the lack of opportunities is the top reason for dissatisfaction at work for women. Uh, it was a strong source of dissatisfaction to those who had left. So here on this uh, small infographic, you can see that uh, many women are failing to access that positive career cycle. Now, this career cycle is not gender specific, but it appears that fewer women essentially get on board. Um, there's a clear link uh, in the data between access to growth opportunities, uh, then a sense of progress and then confidence in meeting aspiration. So advocates, encouragement, advice, all of that helps. Uh, but access to opportunities, that seems to be the key. Um, and this, as I said, this career, this career cycle, uh, this is not gender specific, but it's just that fewer women get on board. So now on to what I, I think personally is, is the most striking uh, result. It's the experience of working uh, flexibly and the fact that it has changed attitudes. Obviously, I've mentioned that the, the survey was pulled after a, a few months of the biggest work experiments ever attempted. Uh, there is a significant shift in attitudes towards flexible working from past to current employees. So we've asked people whether they were 
current employees in financial services or past employees in financial services. And it's pretty typical. It, it, the, the biggest move actually on the right hand side and actually circled in dotted red, uh, you can see that the male respondents, uh, if they were past workers, uh, about half of them thought that their work could not be performed flexibly. But now the vast majority of them, 94%, think that what they do can be performed um, uh, flexibly. Um, Work-life balance was also a top issue amongst uh, female past employees, but it's a lot, it's a less so for, for current female employees. Uh, and then women still perceive taking more flexibility, unfortunately, uh, they still believe that will uh, negatively impact their careers. The perception of fairness and equality, uh, it's a key driver to positive outcomes. Uh, there's a strong perception of a fair working environment, uh, that that was a key driver of satisfaction and hence lower intention to leave. There's a correlation there. And then mid-career, uh, the perceptions of fairness actually fall. So there are differences in how equality is defined. And I know we'll talk about that with Grace on the on the panel. Defining uh, what equality means for everyone is essentially uh, uh, really important because if people have different definitions of that, then obviously we're never going to get we're never going to get anywhere. In terms of conclusion, we'll talk to we'll talk about stretch assignments, we'll talk about getting on that positive career cycle and what can be done to get there. On the flexibility, there's obviously the view that we need to exploit the shift in attitudes post-COVID uh, to reorganize work in a more flexible way, which benefits essentially both genders, it has to be gender neutral. Uh, and therefore it means to change the narrative so that this is no longer about accommodating women's needs and constraints, but about better outcome and better productivity. And finally, this definition of equality um, I've mentioned. In the report, and, and please uh, please open it, uh, read, read, or read those pages at the end, uh, uh, is included a, a large perspective from, uh, from Grace, uh, and she gives actually uh, some very interesting uh, takeaways, notably uh, looking at uh, how to use stretch assignments, how to, uh, how to uh, build a, a good sponsoring program, uh, and finally how to, uh, how, how to look at mistakes, for example. Those, those are a number of things we can discuss. But I'd like to say uh, that the biggest takeaway, again, is the fact that the survey was conducted during the pandemic. It highlights the opportunity uh, for change that the COVID-19 crisis uh, presents. And there is more than uh, that unites men and women that divides them. And I think a lot of us knew that deep down, but the survey demonstrates it. So uh, again, concluding, I'd say that those employees with more flexibility in where they work and how they work, uh, and that can be uh, incredibly uh, intense and, and, um, and uh, senior employees, uh, they also work longer hours. So if you have more flexibility in where and how you work, uh, you also work longer hours. Uh, employees that are then more satisfied and they exhibit a lower intention to leave. So what's not to like for employers? Uh, this actually aligns very well uh, with other credible evidence that uh, greater flexibility leads to greater productivity and happier workers. And that is not my finding. This is very much Grace's finding, and, and she can talk about that. And I think measuring that productivity is essentially what Grace would argue is the single biggest thing we all have to do. Um, these observations are all worth exploring further uh, at this time of reorganization of work, and we should absolutely focus on the action that will allow uh, workers to thrive, whether they are men or women. So this inaugural survey uh, will inform the second phase of the uh, ACT research program, which will be conducted uh, in the first half of 2021. Uh, the final report uh, is due in May 2021, so we'll have actual recommendation and we will also have recommendation for uh, interventions, which our partner firms listed uh, before, will take forward and measure. And with that, uh, I hope I've given you a good idea about what's in the report. Uh, and now we're on to our panel. Thank you, Elise, for that excellent summary. I'd now like to welcome our distinguished panel of speakers. We have our host, David Schwimmer, CEO of the London Stock Exchange Group and a member of the board of LSEG PLC. We have Dr. Grace Lorden, Associate Professor in Behavioural Science, London School of Economics and Political Science. Dr. Grace Lorden is the founding director of the Inclusion Initiative. We have Alison Moulton, director of the Wisdom Council. 
Allison brings more than 25 years of practical experience in wealth management from a range of firms, including Barclays and Schroeder's. And we have Elise Fedois, Head of Research at WIBF, Deputy Head of Research for EMEA at City, and named in the 2018 Financial News 100 Most Influential Women in Finance. David, if I could pass to you first um, our opening question, which is what do you think has been the most impactful action that London Stock Exchange has taken to deliver actual change in the gender agenda? Thanks, Vivian, and great to be on the panel with you all this morning. There's really, there's no single action, there's no silver bullet that has had uh, the kind of uh, game-changing impact uh, in this area. I think it's really about a lot of different initiatives, a lot of different developments within the London Stock Exchange Group. And I'll just, just to give you a few examples, we have worked with the 30% Club mentoring scheme uh, in terms of looking to develop, uh, identify and develop uh, talent. We have our Women Inspired Network, uh, which we continue to support around the world. Uh, and that has played a key role in uh, helping uh, develop uh, capabilities and uh, inspire and identify uh, women with uh, extraordinary talent. I would say uh, also I should mention that London Stock Exchange Group was an early signatory to uh, here in the UK, the Treasury's Women in Finance Charter. And we set ourselves a stretch target across the group of achieve, achieving 40% women in senior leadership roles. Uh, and we are uh, we set that target for the end of 2020, uh, several years ago, and we have made uh, incremental progress year after year, and it's been co uh, consistent progress. We're not quite there yet, and we have certainly have more work to do, but that has also been a, a real mobilizing force across the group. I would say a, a number of other things. We've uh, we've worked on our hiring practices. We've worked on our uh, managers skills in, again in terms of identifying talent in terms of uh, some of the recruiting uh, processes that we do to make sure that they are uh, gender neutral so it's really across the board uh, many different things and uh, the last thing I should say is that it's it's really important that it is viewed as uh, an initiative and an effort and an ongoing uh, process for the whole organization this is not an HR process uh, of course, HR plays a key role, but many other functions uh, play a key role, and all of our people have to play a key role, uh, including across our, our executive committee. So really a lot of different actions. Fantastic. Thank you. So many of the actions that you've mentioned, I'm sure, resonate um, with others listening in today as well. And you're absolutely right. I don't think there is a single silver bullet. Um, there's actually lots and lots of behaviors and specific interventions that we need to take in order to make a difference. Grace, I wonder if I could turn to you. Um, can you explain why you think changing the narrative is the right title here? Thank you, Vivian. You know, um, so my, my first degree is in computer science and I have a PhD in econometrics. And I spent, I think maybe the first five or six years of my career being very disillusioned at the fact that I could create really credible causal evidence and then somebody would come along with a story that really would be based on one particular anecdote and that would be what would get the attention and you know it really got me thinking about narratives and if we look at the world as it is today I think storytelling has become much more important even when it was when I started when I started studying five or six years ago and if I look at the findings of the report that's coming through we usually start with the premise that men and women are different. So we usually start looking for differences and then trying to create policies that would allow us to retain women in the workforce. And one of the big policies that has come out of that has been flexibility. And, you know, we, we like to say that there's no silver bullet, but if we look at the evidence, flexibility is the policy that has actually created the, the largest probability of being retained for women. So companies that are doing flexibility well, they're much more likely to retain their women as compared to other companies. But I think equally the story that we tell around flexibility is wrong. So we have this narrative, the flexibility is a policy to allow women stay in the workforce because they have more of the second shift. So I think at this point, what's helping them 
is also what's hindering them. So if you think if, if you follow it through, if I'm a woman who takes advantage of flexibility, I might be likely to stay. I might be likely to get to the middle and I might be likely to go even a little bit further than that. But the stigma of having lower labor attachment is still there among my is still there among my colleagues. But there's a, a literature that is really, really credible that suggests that flexible working actually makes people much more productive. So I find it really frustrating that we talk about flexibility in the terms that people who take it are just looking to get better work life balance. When if we look at the literature that's emerging, we can see that it can actually increase productivity in an industry that has had low levels of growth in the last decade relative to other industries. And I think second to that, what really comes out of the, um, the survey that the Wisdom Council has done is that men also thrive under flexibility. So they're much more satisfied and they're putting in more hours if they have flexibility over how and where they work. And it also comes out that men now are much more likely to believe. So I think it's 54% it was for past workers. 95% of current male workers are likely to believe that their job can be done flexibly. So I see this um, I see this title as representing many things in the study that speaks about narratives, but particularly the fact that we should change the narrative around flexibility to allow the policy that has really helped women in the past to also help them move forward, taking away that stigma that it's just about managing childcare and moving towards recognising that it actually allows both men and women being productive. And I think if we change that narrative, the companies that have paternity policies who are saying to me, men still aren't taking them in the same numbers of women, they will see increases in that. And you will also see many more men sorting into flexibility. And when we actually stop over-focusing on the differences between men and women, I think that's when we start moving much closer to equality. Thank you, that was really insightful. And it's interesting um, concept that, that what helps can also hinder. Um, I think one of our members of WIBF recently launched a parental leave policy um, which again applies to both uh, men and women um, and in fact degenders that um, important time where you do need to take some time away which I think is incredibly helpful. Alison could I turn to you and ask the same question really why do you think that changing the narrative is the right title? Yeah, sure. Uh, thanks very much, and thank you for inviting me to the um, panel. Um, when we were selected to conduct this research, um, we obviously looked at various um, what work had already been done in helping us to design the survey. And it became clear from that that in much of the academic research and industry research, and also in popular books like uh, Sheryl Sandberg's Lean In, um, that somehow there was a sense that um, the lack of women in senior roles was partly about women's own actions. Um, that it was about a lack of aspiration, about life choices, um, about them not leaning in to demand and grab those opportunities. Um, and I think the findings of this survey do really question that narrative, which is still out there in, in all of these publications, as I say, um, because we, we found no significant gender differences in aspiration, um, in asking for pay and promotion, um, or in the importance of work in individuals' lives. It, um, in fact, that, has, that area around the importance of work was very much linked more to life stage and to marital and to family status. Um, so I, I think we need to move past that that's already been uh, written to that extent. Also, um, picking up on Grace's points, um, COVID has uh, slightly shown us the art of the possible. Um, and while women have taken on more of the burden of homeschooling and childcare and so on, while they've been um, juggling work, and men have also gone through a massive shift in the last um, nine months. I mean, many men who um, have spent 30 years spending 10 or 12 hours a week uh, commuting are suddenly asking themselves why uh, and thinking about what they can do with that time that's perhaps more valuable and more oriented towards other aspects of their lives and their families. Um, and when I when I started my career, and this is the anecdotal evidence of the storytelling that um, that uh, that Grace highlights as a, an issue as well as um, a part a key part of making change happen. Um, when I started my career, there was definitely a sort of split in responsibilities, and I've really seen that um, change now with um, young parents now absolutely taking the time out for all the prenatal appointments, for the births, taking their parental leave. It's absolutely shifted. I see that in 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 a joint responsibility. Um, 
and maybe that's partly in the wealth management area, which is the sector that I've worked in. Um, but certainly there, I, I really start to see that equality um, coming through. And also, finally, I think also uh, we have to recognise that we've moved on as a society and that we're a long way from a single view of traditional families and a sort of linear life. Um, people have multiple families, they have children at all different ages, they have no children at all, they're in same-sex relationships. There's, there's all sorts of ways that you can live your life today. Um, so I think the combination of those factors is really why um, we were very supportive of the idea of the title of Changing the Narrative. Um, it's about focusing on the things that we have in common, an aspiration to do well, um, the importance of uh, work, of job satisfaction in all of our lives, and the need to be uh, fairly treated. They are the things that at the heart we all have in common across all, um, all genders and ethnicities and everything else. And from there, we can then work to build policies that work for everyone, exactly as, um, as David said, it has to be about the whole organisation, not a male-female gender um, split. Fantastic. Thank you for those insights. Um, could I at least could I ask you the next question, which is um, access to stretch assignments comes across very strongly in the inaugural findings. Uh, what can companies do differently to help ensure that women do get those opportunities? Uh, well, thank you, Vivian. I mean that that's I mean that's a great question, and obviously, being uh, having practical implementation uh, is really really important. I think if you take a step back, what, what corporates have done well over the last few years is look at their formal promotion processes, for example, because they are very uh, measurable and, uh, for example, human resources, David was mentioning human resources, they, they support me in my role every day managing the department that I manage. And they help a lot with the formal points in one's career. Uh, but the problem are the informal points, and I think stretch assignments is our way to put a name on the very small and very big decisions you make outside of this promotion and those formal moments. And I think what corporates can do to answer specifically your question, and certainly what uh, we will try to do uh, at City, is to look at those decisions and make managers aware that when they give something to someone, one assignment, whether it's very small or whether it's a new client or there's also someone they don't give it to. And have they, have they given it some thought or have they done that uh, as a almost knee jerk reaction or they were in a rush or someone just resigned, they needed to reassign work really quickly. Have they actually done that work really, really, really thoroughly? Uh, have they taken sometimes the even 10 minutes to think about that? And I think that's that's what's very important when it comes to stretch assignments, because it will guide the future of your employees. I don't think it's actually gender specific. I think it will benefit everyone and the organizations. But I think it disproportionately impacts women, it seems, in, in, in the survey. And maybe that's something we can correct. Fantastic. Thank you. David, um, could I ask you, how does the Long London Stock Exchange Group ensure that it develops and embeds a unified culture across the business, particularly when your operations span the globe? So developing and embedding a culture is uh, a pretty extensive process, and it's actually something we spend a lot of time on uh, at London Stock Exchange Group. And it, uh, even in the best of circumstances, it, it it can take a, an extensive period of time uh, and a matter of years, but it requires consistent communication across the organization it, it, and it requires consistent behavior, uh, certainly starting with the leadership, but again, across the organization over an extended period of time. I think pretty much, uh, I think every uh, or most organizations these days will uh, express a commitment to diversity, express a commitment to equal opportunity for all. I think it's incredibly important when trying to embed a culture that you see that not just being words and you see that in action. And uh, an example where I think we've seen that in action at London Stock Exchange Group is in the, uh, the real vibrancy of our networks. And last year, uh, we rolled out our uh, inclusion network, launched our global inclusion network, which has acted as an umbrella network for all of the other networks within the organization. I, I already touched in my remarks before on 
our Women Inspired Network, which continues to grow and, and do terrific work on a global basis. We also have uh, Being, uh, our BAME network. We have uh, LGBTQ uh, network, uh, Proud, uh, a parents network, a disability network. And uh, all of these uh, we're very supportive of, and I think our, our people are very supportive of them. And that, that's just an example of a way that we can uh, show in our actions and in our support uh, how committed we are to diversity uh, and equal opportunity for all really across the culture and on a global basis. But it is, it's an ongoing process and uh, we have to regularly uh, and consistently demonstrate that commitment. Thank you. That was really insightful because I think one of the big challenges is how do you approach this consistently across different countries, different cultures, and different parts of the workforce. Um, Grace, could I ask you uh, the next question, which is the survey found that women were less certain in their careers and more likely to see barriers. Do you think that's partly that women are just less confident and more likely to express those, them, so those concerns, or do you have another view? You know, so I mean, kind of building off of what Alison says, I think we need to be very careful about interpreting this as women having lower levels of confidence. So I think the starting point, and you know, we are an LSEG today who um, spend a lot of time um, gathering, um, 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 excuse me, um, spend a lot of time um, creating indices and thinking about market data and statistics. So I think the answer to this um, particular question is about how can we measure it to learn about whether it's about the women's perceptions themselves that something is holding them back when it's not, or whether there are actual obstacles in their way. And I think given the what's coming through in this survey, I would be willing to bet that it's the latter rather than the former. And, you know, I think that there's a kind of a, a really good saying that goes around diversity and inclusion, what gets measured gets done. And I think this is really relevant here. And we're now in a place where firms are gathering really good statistics on diversity. They're gathering really good audits on their promotions and also on who's negotiating for pay. And I think the next step is to gather some data on the type of interventions that they're actually creating to solve the problem. So for example, if they do believe that women have different perceptions that are not actually realized, they're obviously creating interventions to surround that. You know, I know many companies embed confidence training in their leadership programs. They never evaluate whether or not it actually worked and they never actually follow up whether or not that training then caused women to ask for more later. And I think that's what's actually missing here. Um, so, you know, to take Alison's um, line, I think we should change the narrative around whether women are actually asking for more. We can audit it, which tells us a bit about their confidence, but we can also look to see whether or not there are obstacles. And kind of building off of what Elise said, she pointed out, you know, the stretchy work is really important. And it's really, really simple to audit who is actually getting stretchy work and to give that back to the managers, to make salient to them, whether or not they tend to pick people who are like them, or they pick certain types of people more often than picking women, for example. Um, so I, so I, I really kind of want us to go away from today with the idea that, you know, we're changing the narrative around whether or not women are confident in work, and we're really moving to this idea that we're going to try to remove obstacles, but all the time auditing for cost effectiveness. Thank you, Grace. I love the science of the measuring part of it as well, um, in order to actually determine whether our measures are being effective. Um, Alison, could I ask you a question, please, which is um, that the finding um, that the importance of work and ambition doesn't change when women have young children was very interesting. Uh, were you surprised by that? And what lessons are there for organizations? Um. Yeah, well, and um, we weren't actually surprised by that finding too much because it's a strong theme that we see coming through all of our consumer research. Um, last year, we ran a major program aiming to understand why women were so disengaged with long-term savings and investments. Um, the gender pensions gap is even bigger than the gender pay gap um, for all sorts of reasons, not all of which are just because of the gender pay gap. Um, women really don't engage with long-term savings for their own um, futures. And then through that program of work, we spoke to women um, right across the country in all different walks of life. 
um, all different uh, levels of education and right across representative of uh, the female um, population of the UK. Um, and one of the things that came out of that that was really highlighted was ambition. Um, we identified it as one of the uh, main pillars, the uh, six pillars that underpinned women's lives. Um, and it's not ambition in terms of um, necessarily status or hierarchy. It's, a, it's about ambition to, to do well, to have a good life, and then importantly, ambition for themselves, for their families, and for their, their communities and the people that they care about. And so it, it's sort of logical, and we saw in that program as well, that when you have a young child and you have a family, that that ambition should increase um, because you've now got somebody else that you need to be ambitious for, not just uh, not just for your for yourself. Um, and the other thing that slightly came across in, in that survey as well, that that ambition was it's quite entre entrepreneurial and it's quite risk taking. Um, women do take a lot of risks in their lives. Um, so so no, we, we weren't surprised. Um, by that finding at all. Um, I think what the question is what can organizations do about that in thinking about it from a, um, a work um, perspective. And um, I know I've, it's sort of forced me, this whole project forced me to look back and think of some of the, the way I've behaved when I've been a manager and running teams. Um, and I think there's just um, subconsciously when somebody's returning to work, um, they're working reduced hours, you kind of subconsciously almost end up it being reduced work and, and, and maybe it is reduced quantity of work because they're not there for the same hours but it, it absolutely shouldn't be about reduced quality of work and, and maybe we're trying to um, think well I don't want to put too much pressure on them and we're trying to accommodate um, that which is, is just the worst thing that, that we could do what we need to do is recognize that they absolutely want that quality of work um, and they um, that absolutely should still get the same interest in and challenging and, and developmental work as, as anybody else should. They're just working reduced um, reduced hours or, or, or um, flexible um, hours. So I think for organisations, it's about trying to trying to just recognise that assumption that a lot of us are making and, and think and think about when women do return to work, don't make those assumptions. Um, and equally, I would look at it from the male perspective as well. You know, when a when a um, a man has a young child, um, they're going to alter their, uh, they need to be a bit more flexible. They they might not be able to put those extra hours in because they want to spend that time with the child as well. So are you also being fair in how you're assessing the man and how their priorities might have changed a little bit in, the, in, that, in that short term? So I guess, again, it's not making assumptions. It's really trying to understand that individual and, and what is important to that, um, to that individual. It goes back to David's point about management training, really good people management training is, is to me the key this. Um, I'd also make a slightly link point about this entrepreneurial drive which didn't come out in this survey but um, is one of the big trends that we do see in our consumer research and I think that's an issue for um, financial services as a whole and um, how do you keep financial services attractive both to females but also to both genders um, if you start to see more of that sort of entrepreneurial risk taking ambition for ourselves rather than a sort of competitive hierarchy um, ambition you know we don't want to end up with the missing middle is is kind of the missing across the whole of financial services because they've gone to more interest in all uh, sectors um, rather than it being a gender a gender problem so um yeah I think thinking about ambition and entrepreneurship and how you can incorporate those into your organizations is key fantastic thank you very much for those insights um, We've got lots of questions coming in on Slido, so I'm going to start moving to those. But before I do, Grace, um, I know that you've said that, um, uh, sorry, I was going to ask you a question about um, hosting at the London Stock Exchange Group, but actually um, what I wanted to say is, can you pick out the three clear lessons that you want the audience to take home today as a result of the report on the findings? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think the first one is to say that flexible working arrangements make both men and women more productive. Um, so I think as we're reorganizing work because of COVID-19, we really have to take an experimental approach to thinking about what type of flexibility we offer to employees and also measuring outputs. And I think the second lesson is just that. We're over-focused, I think, in financial services even today on inputs, on presenteeism, and we don't focus enough on outputs. And, you know, I often get, when I'm in conversation with this, often the response is, well, we can't measure output. 
but there's lots of things in financial services that are intangible that are measured. Um, so I think that if we actually move towards thinking about how do we actually measure output, yes, there'll be uncertainty, but I think there's no better industry to understand, you know, standard errors um, and how to actually interpret that uncertainty than the financial services industry. And I think the third is that we have to change the narrative. So the starting point can't be that women are, um, women have constraints, that women do have um, differences to men. The starting point should be, let's learn about the men and women in financial and professional services and interpret the data that's before us. And I think if we do that, and if you look back at some of the data that's come out over the 10 years, and Alison mentioned Lean In. So Lean In makes a big deal about you know, confidence gaps and you know um, gaps in putting yourself forward as women. But if you actually look at the data, you'll see that men and women aren't that different. So yes, women do tend to put themselves forward slightly less than men and feel, and feel uncomfortable doing so. But equally, men don't like putting themselves forward. The gap between men and women is really, really small. So moving away from differences and just recognizing that there might be intensity of preferences, deviations between men and women, but in general, men and women like the same thing. They like collaborative work. They like, um, they like flexible work arrangements. And both genders really want to do well in their career and they strive to be successful. Fantastic. Thank you so much. So let's head to our Slido questions. Elise, there's one here for you. Um, at the European level, there are talks about preserving the advances of the past 25 years. Do you think there is a risk of sliding back and how don't we do that? Uh, obviously, uh, the risk of sliding back uh, happens often uh, and uh, we, we have made progress, I think. Uh, uh, clearly, the, the the, the key now is, uh, you know, we, we evolve obviously uh, everything. I think it's fair to say, and, and you know, we all encounter it and let's, let's not hide from it. There is diversity fatigue at times, but I'm not sure that there's inclusion fatigue. And actually, um, I think as we evolve uh, how we talk about uh, uh, the concept, I think everyone is likely to recognize that um, with the, the large advances of ESG and with this pandemic, um, I think um, the world has come to realize that actually uh, uh, we have to change a lot of our practices. And I think uh, being an inclusive env environment uh, where every voice is, is heard uh, is very, very important. So actually, when I look at the world outside, sometimes it's easy to look at your own team, your own little environment where some things may go wrong and may not go the right way. Uh, but when you look at the big trends around the world, I'm actually um, I'm actually an optimist, and I think uh, um, it's moving in the right direction. Um, and I just look at at you know in the investor world, impact funds actually asking for that inclusion data, um, and uh, and now perhaps uh, you know essentially investing on the back of it and and not giving funding if, if they don't see that that being really actually happening in the corporates they want to invest in. So I'll just use that from my personal uh, uh, perspective as, as an analyst. Terrific. Thank you so much. Um, David, here's a question from Slido for you. Um, do you have um, direct interactions with young female talents? Your words of encouragement would mean a lot to them. I do. Uh, on actually a pretty regular basis, um, and I, I try at least once a week to spend time uh, with our people uh, at a, uh, an informal basis. Uh, yesterday, I actually spoke to uh, a women's network that includes some people within LSEG and some outside. Uh, I think, I agree, I think it is really important uh, that I and that our, our senior leadership uh, really across the group do spend time with our people uh, at all levels, just to make sure that we have that kind of connection and that people have uh, the opportunity to uh, really engage on these topics. Um, I think it's, you know, it's, it's not just about my spending time with people. I think this is an opportunity for uh, other uh, senior leaders, men, women, uh, to take the time to connect with our people, both within our own organizations, but within other organizations, uh, and make sure that we're talking about these issues. I think one of the, the most important things we learned uh, this past year, uh, in particular with respect to the Black Lives Matter uh, movement, was that within so many organizations, it's awkward to even talk about uh, 
issues of uh, ethnicity or uh, racial diversity. And we have to get past uh, that kind of awkwardness, whether it's gender issues, whether it's uh, ethnicity issues. We have to create environments where it's okay uh, to talk about these kinds of things, uh, not just okay, but encouraged. And uh, I think that has had a big impact for us already, but again, lots, lots more to do. Fantastic, thank you so much. Um, Grace, here's a question from Slido for you. Um, has COVID-19 been a bit of a blessing in disguise in terms of this entire dialogue? Oh, absolutely, Vivian. I think, you know, the 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 number of times. So so if we think about the differences between men and women in financial services, a lot of the pay gap comes down to the type of jobs that men and women choose. And a lot of the missing middle actually comes from the jobs that tend to have higher shares of males. So what comes out of this report is that there are aspects of the environment with higher shares of males that are conducive to having better work environments for all. And we should pay attention to that but equally presenteeism is valued much more than in the functions where that's not necessarily so. And the jobs that have the higher shares of males, people would often say they can't be done remotely. So I would have conversations and talk about, you know, can we offer more flexibility around uh, around this job? And, and people would say, well, no, this one, this, this one can't be done remotely. It can't be done flexibly. It's actually impossible to work from home. And I think the same people who are in those roles are now saying that working from home firstly makes them much happier because somebody spoke about the commute. And I think it's exactly right that, you know, kind of lowering commuter times in, in, in London is, a, is, is, is an extraordinarily pleasant thing. But also a lot of people have actually knocked it out of the park. So they've been able to do their jobs just as well as they were and these are you know trading and sales roles and i appreciate that there's regulatory concerns around these um that aren't that simple to um to resolve but still the people in those roles are reporting that they can be done um well at home and i think with that it allows us to reorganize work bearing in mind the lessons the flexibility brings more productive work in a way that's conducive for both men and women to, both men and women to thrive and we never would have had that if we didn't have the um the health shock of the pandemic Thank you very much. Uh, David, this is a popular one on Slido and it's for you. Um, you mentioned that the stigma from flexible working has been removed and this is a good thing for women. Can you elaborate on that? Sure, I think um, the, the, maybe the historical perception and uh, there are there's lots of expertise on this panel that can talk about this with more data and I'll just be using uh, anecdotal data here, but I think uh, the histor historical perception uh, was that, um, you know, perhaps women wanted to work uh, more flexibly more than men. Uh, and with the, the data in this report, uh, which really uh, reflects that men are kind of seeing the light and getting on board here uh, and being supportive of working flexibly, I think that uh, in many ways, I don't want to say it addresses the issue, but it helps uh, really resolve the issue of companies really pushing harder and making more of an effort to adapt. And this year clearly was forced on all of us, uh, but it will, uh, I, I think it will persist and we can talk about how it, it may persist, but to make more of an effort uh, to create flexibility for all of their employees. And uh, in many ways, taking away the uh, I'll call it the gender element of uh, working flexibly or working remotely. Uh, now there, there are, I think that this is not um, <clears throat> super simple and there are issues and challenges still associated with it. And so here in the UK, uh, kids are mostly back in school uh, and that makes it a, a lot easier. I think in, in other jurisdictions in, in the US where a lot of schools are closed, uh, that is having an impact uh, and it may be having an impact uh, more on uh, women at home than on men. Uh, this is a situation uh, driven obviously by the pandemic uh, and what's that what that's doing to schools. Uh, but I do think we just have to we have to keep in mind that while there's progress being made in terms of working flexibly, there are there are other issues still lurking out there that we've got to be aware of, uh, thoughtful about and uh, still focused on addressing. Thank you very much. Um, Elise, could I ask you, um, City is a sponsor of this research. Uh, which of these actions are you going to take back to embed in practice? 
Uh, well, obviously, Vivian, we want to wait. Uh, uh, there'll be more actions and more, more perhaps specifically uh, uh, defined actions by Grace uh, in May 2020. And please, everyone should look out for those. But uh, in terms of the early findings and, and what we have already in this report, um, I think the two uh, more pressing ones that City uh, was already partially working on, but definitely uh, not working very hard on, uh, one stretch assignments, I've mentioned it. And I would mention stretch assignments because actually this, this topic here is the missing middle. But where I've mentioned, uh, you know, you have essentially uh, those formal promotion points and you have the in-between points. Uh, that's true about the missing middle. But remember that obviously once you make managing director between managing director and C-suite, uh, essentially it's all stretch assignments. Uh, so uh, this topic is also very, very important for, for the, the, um, the sort of uh, the, the women at the top uh, situation as well. Um, so it almost addresses um, a number of issues, not just the missing middle. So I think stretch assignments, first one. Uh, and then obviously uh, we are working really hard to understand how we make the most uh, of our work experience with, with the COVID. And we have a number of, of, of traders who have traded for months actually uh, from home. Um, uh, which was unthinkable. Um, how do we take that and how do we build build perhaps some flexibility in some of the roles we never thought could have some flexibility? Uh, that's that's the second uh, big, big uh, job. And so uh, I, I, would, I would call those two. I, I am very keen to hear more. We have findings and I, I'll invite everyone to read the research, but on mistakes and treatment of mistakes, we have, uh, we, we have a number of other uh, smaller, perhaps more micro decisional findings, which we need to look into. But I would call stretch assignments and uh, sort of informal, flexible working, I would call it, are the two areas that we we at City will definitely work very hard on. Thanks very much, Elise. Um, interesting you mentioned the mistakes piece. Um, Grace, I'm fascinated by the exploration of gender differences in mistakes. Can you explain your thinking behind this suggestion? Yes, so you know, so coming if, if if you listen to anecdotal evidence, um, women in financial services do say that they're treated differently when they're make made when they make mistakes as compared to their male peers. And we thought it would be interesting to explore this further in the survey that we put out. So there were three questions on it. So it asked about whether mistakes are seen as learning opportunities, whether people are penalized for um, whether penalized whether people are penalized for mistakes. And lastly, whether or not people would feel that they could actually speak up very easily when they make a mistake. And this is where we find, you know, big gender differences in the survey, which is really fascinating to me. So women are much more likely to report that they will be penalized for mistakes as compared to men. And in comparison, men are much more likely to see uh, mistakes as learning opportunities. Um, and what we really want to do as we move into year two is figure out, firstly, how men and women differ in how they actually define making a mistake. And secondly, figure out whether the finding in our survey is down to perceptions or whether it's actually down to realized treatment. And I think we have to take seriously that there is a possibility that men and women are treated differently when they make the mistakes to the benefit of men. There's a long literature out there to suggest that we do this when it comes to attributing whether um, people's successes. So, for example, for women, we're much more likely to view a woman as lucky if she has a particularly good outcome, as compared to with men, we're much more likely to um, assign it to their ability. And I kind of see the mistakes as the upside down version of that. So kind of looking at when you do do something that isn't necessarily good what is the reaction from colleagues and of course if i put myself forward for a stretch assignment and i make a mistake on the first stretch assignment and i'm penalized for that i'm probably less likely to be pushing for the second stretch assignment if it's not necessarily um, offered to me so you know in behavioral science we like to say that you know small things that happen to us can have disproportionate effects on our outcomes and I think this is one of those things, how mistakes is treated in the workplace, that might be one of those small things that's holding women back from achieving um, larger outcomes. Fantastic, thank you very much. That's quite a challenging question. Uh, David, could I turn to you? Um, the survey was carried out during COVID-19, which is one of the unique features of it. Um, what is your biggest DNI learning from the COVID crisis and what will you be doing differently as a result in future? A big question. Yeah, we've we've learned a lot during this COVID crisis. I think a couple couple different aspects of it. First, maybe I'll just start with communication. So 
in the past, we would typically have a survey of all of our people once a year. Uh, and since March of this year, I think we just completed our third survey. So just a lot more communication, and that's an example but uh, uh, of communication, a lot more communication uh, with our people. And that's both uh, to uh, all of our people, but also surveying uh, their views and hearing more from them. And I think that will certainly persist after uh, we get out of this. I would say uh, we have more focus on our people's mental health. Uh, and that was probably not, uh, well, it certainly was not nearly as much of a focus uh, prior to this. Uh, and during this year, I think we've had something approximately uh, 300 of our uh, of our colleagues have gone through mental health awareness training uh, so that they can then be a resource to their colleagues. Uh, and so to have those 300 people sprinkled throughout the organization of, of a broader 5,000 uh, is a new resource for us. Uh, and I think we'll see that kind of continued emphasis on focus on uh, mental health and mental health awareness uh, continue after this. I think, uh, and uh, I, I probably won't spend more time on uh, the remote working, but we've learned an incredible amount about flexible working or remote working, and that will have a, a long, uh, long standing and persistent impact. And again, uh, there's great research on that uh, in this report, and we've heard uh, from some of the experts on that, but that will have an impact on us. And then maybe the, the last point I would just touch on is, and this maybe not a direct outcome of the uh, the pandemic and lockdown, but certainly an, an outcome of the discussion this past year on, on diversity uh, issues uh, is just making sure that that these issues are uh, acceptable to talk about and really uh, out there uh, and that there's no taboo about talking about them uh, and that we should all be talking about them. And these are not issues that uh, just women should be talking about or just black employees should be talking about. Uh, or other groups, but they're they're part of uh, the overall organization uh, and part of our overall culture, and we should all uh, feel comfortable uh, talking about them and, and having them be part of our regular interaction. Super, thank you so much. Grace, we're almost coming to the end, so I'm going to ask you to answer this one quickly, but it's a loaded question. Um, rising hours worked when working flexibly may increase output, but does it actually increase or improve productivity? Oh, Vivian, you should never ask an academic to answer the last question quickly. I'm not. I'm not sure I'm capable of that. But I think you know the, there is evidence to suggest that flexible working arrangements does improve productivity. Um, and I think the I, I like to distinguish between what I call the stock of knowledge and the flow of knowledge. So the stock are things that I feel comfortably saying as stylized facts. And the flow of knowledge is things that we're learning about. And I think with flexibility, we're still in the learning phase. And that's why I think, you know, companies like LSEG and City and, you know, other um, other um, lar large institutions um, who are sponsoring um, this project can really take seriously having an experimental approach to flexible working arrangements where they track when they pull a lever and they change what's been offered to their employees, that they also track how it actually changes the outcomes. So the research that's there is, is really pointing in the direction that this is actually worth betting on. Um, but, but we do need much more evidence and we're only going to get that if companies buy into the idea that they should be training outputs. And there's nowhere else in the business where people would think about having, a, a you know, spending an, a, a, an extraordinary sum of money um, on something and not track the output. So if we can get companies to embrace this experimental approach, I think next year I'll be able to give you a stylized fact on that. Fantastic. Thank you. And you were super fast there as well. Um, there is actually a final question. And I suspect this one is probably for me which is, is there still opportunity for other organizations to join the next phases of the program? And if so, please advise what are the steps to onboard new organizations? So absolutely, we do have um, a few more places in terms of sponsorship available, and we'd be delighted uh, to hear from you. After this event, we'll be sending around a, a link uh, both to the WIBF website and how to contact Liz Hughes, our head of research, um, who will be um, uh, able to assist you um, and also for a recording of the event. 
But before we close, um, I can't help summarizing some of the fascinating insights, and I'm sure you probably have many more as well. Um, some of the takeaways from today are the art of the possible, we need to be thinking positively, uh, the degendering of flexible working, inclusion is so important to everything that we do, uh, what gets measured gets done. We've heard that many times, but it's absolutely true. And I think that's part of the science um, that's being brought to, to this report and what we should be bringing to all of what we do as well. Um, and that the COVID environment has really accelerated many endeavors that we've been trying to achieve for so long. So particularly around concepts on um, flexible working and also focusing on the DNI agenda in a much more uh, meaningful way and impactful way as well. So I'd just like to say thank you so much to our incredible panelists for their insights, for their expertise, and also for their candor. Um, that was a really interesting and exciting uh, discussion. Thank you also to all of our participants for your excellent questions on Slido. Um, there were some really insightful ones there. A thank you to the London Stock Exchange Group for hosting us today, to our sponsors for making this research possible, and to our partners, the London School of Economics and the Wisdom Council. And I look forward to speaking with you all again um, in May when we publish the final report um, of our research findings. And we look forward to um, welcoming more sponsors into this exciting journey on how we accelerate change together. Thank you, everyone. Goodbye.